Hello everyone, I'm Theo Hartzell. In today's video, we're going to be covering the subject about what are demons? What exactly are they? Now, I'm not going to cover their origination and where they came from in this video. I want to focus instead, for time's sake of length of video, I want to focus on what exactly they are. I want to understand what they are, how they operate, what does the Bible say about them? Who is ruling and controlling them and telling them what to do? What do they do? How do they manifest? What are abilities and characteristics and things that they can do or manifestations that they cause people to have? I want to focus exactly on what demons are. I'll show you that the Old Testament talks about them. I'll show you how people perceived their presence We'll move into the New Testaments and we'll look into what the Bible specifically said and how it relates to evil spirits, unclean spirits, foul spirits, spirits of infirmities. We are going to cover a lot of information and you're going to learn a lot. I'm not going to approach this video trying to cause terror or fear inside of you over demons. The Bible emphatically tells us that they quake and they shake and they tremble at the presence of God. Therefore, the demons are more afraid of you than you should be afraid of them. God, you see right now, every person that's listening to or watching this video, right now, I forbid the devil to strike fear, terror, or torment in their heart, mind, soul, or spirit in any way, in any form, or any fashion. I decree and declare victory and liberty over us right now and that we will walk away with a good, godly understanding and revelation of your word and this subject about demons. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, let's just jump into Job chapter 4, starting at verse 15. And it says, Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up, it stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying. Now, this is Eliphaz, which is one of Job's friends talking, and he is describing a sensation in what happened to his body when he saw and discerned that there was a spirit there. Sometimes when you perceive there is a spirit, you can have a physical reaction in your body that normally results in your hair standing on end and your skin gets like goosebumps, like you're cold, and you just kind of get a tingly sensation and you are aware that there is something beside you. The reason I'm saying this is because Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible and they understood the concept of there being unseen spirits that you cannot see and cannot even discern really what they are because they're hidden from your perception. The Old Testament is full of references of demon spirits and spirit activity that they could not see. So yes, demon spirits are even around before Jesus came on the scene and started casting out devils. Demons go all the way back, and they understood it, and that's why they didn't have to teach or talk about it so much, because they all understood it, and it was part of their culture. Now, let me show you another verse that's fascinating in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. This verse right here tells us and cautions us be careful of how you talk to and treat and communicate with people who you don't know. Because the Bible here says that sometimes people have even entertained angels and did not realize that it was an angel. This shows us that spirits, angels at least, and I believe demon spirits also, have an ability to stop you from perceiving or realizing that they are even in your midst. Otherwise, you would be aware of angels and demons 24 hours a day because spiritual beings are all around you, but on the other side of your perception. Why is that important? Because there can be a demon spirit around you and you don't even know it's there. There can be an angel spirit that is there, a ministering spirit, and you're not even aware that it's there. 
because they can stop you from perceiving that they are close to you or near to you. In the case of Job's friend, Eliphaz, we saw that he was perceiving or realized there was a spirit there and the hair stood up on his body all over because he perceived that the spirit was there. Now I want to go over to the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 13 and 21, and we're going to look at some Old Testament passages here, but it says, but wild beast of the desert shall lie there and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures and owls shall dwell there and satyrs shall dance there. Isaiah 34 and 14, the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl shall also rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Now, one of the reasons that I'm showing you this is because I want you to look at the references there in both of those passages. It's talking about wild beast, desert places, houses, something living in the houses, doleful creatures, owls, satyrs, crying out to the fellows, looking for a place of rest. And this is going to be important later when we see what Jesus was talking about when unclean spirits go out of a man, they go through dry places looking for rest, finding none, and say they're going to go back to their house to take up residence. You can see that whole understanding of how demon spirits operate and what they do is all the way in the Old Testament. And I'll show you what that word for satire means. But first, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 7, And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. Now, something I want you to notice, in all three of these scriptures, it is the Hebrew word 8163, and it is the Hebrew word sair, which means a male goat or a hairy goat demon. In other words, they had an understanding that demon spirits were represented by a male goat or a hairy goat. They were literally at some places and times worshiping goats as idols. And therefore, when you see in connection like many times to heavy metal music and stuff, they have emblems of a upside down star that looks like a goat because it really is literally tying in to the Old Testament belief that these demons were hairy goat, male type creatures, and that's what they looked like. Now let's look at another passage in connection to they offered their children as sacrifices to their idols. Deuteronomy 32, 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Psalms 106, 37. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. That word for devils there is the Hebrew word 7700, shade, which literally means a demon. According to the Thayer Dictionary, it's demon, but it's spelt D-A-E-M-O-N, which you need to pay attention to because that will be important as we move into the New Testament. But this is also a reference to demons. So we have seen that demons are referred to as sires, which have a reference of this hairy, goat, male, demon-looking creature. And then we also have this one here, which is the Hebrew word shade, which means demons, literally demon spirits. Now I want to jump into the New Testament and cover first what the devil himself is and explain that in the Greek. Matthew 4 and 1 says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now notice that first off. Where are they at when he gets tempted? In the wilderness. Can you see how this all ties together about desert and wild beast and wilderness and dry places? And the devil comes to attack in the wilderness. 
Now that word for devil right there is G, one, two, two, eight, diabolos, which means slanderer or false accuser used for Satan himself. Now the reason that I'm just highlighting that is because the King James Version Bible uses the words like devil and devils over and over. However, in the Greek, sometimes we realize it's talking about demons and it's not talking about the devil himself. And so I wanted to show you this word, G1228, is diabolos. And when you see that word, it's talking about the devil himself, Satan himself. Now I want to move to Luke chapter 10 and start at verse 17 and you'll see why I did that and why that's important. Because it says, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. That word for devils right there is the Greek word G1140, daimonion, and it literally means evil spirits or messengers and ministers of the devil, used of the Jewish meaning of a demon. Did you see that? In other words, what we saw in the Old Testament, their understanding and knowledge of demon spirits, whether sires or shades, has now come over and they still understand that now the Greek word is daimonion, but it is still talking about a demon spirit. It also means evil spirit or demon subject to Satan, a demonic being. And I want you to notice that spelling right there, that D-A-E-M-O-N-I-C, because that is the exact same spelling that we saw from the Old Testament in the Hebrew word shade. It is the same spelling. Why is it the same spelling? Because this thought process and understanding of demon spirits from the Old Testament has flowed right over into the New Testament and continued on, and now we are picking up and transitioning from the Hebrew word to the Greek word. However, we are understanding that we are talking about the exact same thing, and they are demon spirits, spirits that are subject to Satan, evil messengers, or ministers of the devil, but it is literally demonic spirits or spiritual beings. Now I want to move over and we'll go to Luke 13 and 10 and start there because I want to show you that Satan is over all the demons. In other words, Satan is their ruler, their commander, and telling them what to do. In Luke 13 and 10 it says, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. Everybody say spirit of infirmity. She had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. So I want you to get a picture of this. This woman is in the synagogue and for 18 years, she has been bent over, hunched back, back problems, and cannot straighten herself up. And the Bible tells you why. Because she had a spirit of infirmity. And that word for spirit right there is G4151, pneuma, which means a spirit or a spirit being. That word for infirmity right there is G769, osthenia, which means malady, feebleness, or weakness. So you can see what an evil spirit is able to do is to cause a manifestation of a physical problem that for this woman is resulting in malady, feebleness, or weakness. Going to verse 12, And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Skipping down to verse 16, and Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, and he says, and ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Now, the reason that I'm showing you this and want you to pay attention was because the Bible said in verse 11 that the woman had a spirit of infirmity. And then Jesus Christ comes right back 
in talking to the religious leaders in verse 16 and says that the woman was actually bound by Satan himself, which shows us that Jesus Christ himself is the one that made the connection that the spirit of infirmity binding the woman was a result of Satan himself. What does that mean? That means that Satan himself, Diabolos, Satan, Lucifer, is the one that is in charge and control of and telling evil spirits and demon spirits what to do, what their assignment is, who they're going to attack, who they're going to afflict, and what they're going to do. Jesus Christ himself right here, and we'll look at other scriptures, but Jesus Christ right here is the one that says the woman had a spirit of infirmity, but was actually bound by Satan. Why? Because Satan is the one controlling and telling the spirit of infirmity what to do, who to go after, who to attack, and Satan is the chief ruler, the chief commander over all demon spirits and evil spirits. Another verse I'll show you is in Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow, and that's talking about Jesus, doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Both of those words for devils right there is G1140, daimonion, meaning demons. In other words, the Pharisees are hearing it, and the Pharisees say right here that Jesus is actually casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. Beelzebub is another name and title for Satan or Lucifer himself, and it was a common title among the Jews to refer to Satan himself and means Lord of the Flies. So even the Pharisees themselves know and understand that Satan himself is in charge of and controlling the demons and telling them what to do. And look at what Jesus said in verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Listen to verse 26. This is important. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? So let me try to put this in context to help you understand what's going on. The Pharisees say, because they don't want to accept and acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, so they say, the reason that you're casting out the devils is you're actually doing it by Satan, Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies himself. And Jesus turns right around and says, uh-uh, wait a second, hold on. Because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, then how could his kingdom stand? In other words, the way that Jesus is saying this is if I am casting out evil and unclean and foul demonic spirits and spirits of infirmity and all of this evil stuff by Satan then it would actually be destroying Satan's kingdom. And Satan wouldn't let me do that if I was doing it that way. This again reinforces and shows us that Jesus Christ himself is saying that the kingdom of darkness, evil spirits, foul spirits, unclean spirits, demonic spirits of infirmity, whatever spirit you want to name, is actually under the chief ruler, Satan himself. If Satan starts casting out spirits of infirmity or unclean and foul spirits, it would be him fighting his own people and fighting his own kingdom. And Jesus himself says right here, Satan is not going to do that. Satan is not going to cast out an unclean spirit because Satan's the one who got him there and gave him his assignment. Satan is not going to cast out a spirit of infirmity because Satan is the one who got that spirit of infirmity there and told him what to do gave him his marching orders and said, this is what you're going to do. Satan is not going to go around casting out all these evil spirits, which shows us that Satan is the commanding officer and the one in charge of them telling and commanding them what to do, which ought to make you ask this question. Well, how did he get control over them? Who are these demon spirits? Why are they running around and having to obey him? 
because he's the chief ruler and the chief commander telling them and commanding them what to do. Now I want to move over into another section. And in this section, I will show you that demons are actually evil spirits. They are all one and the same. It is the same thing. So you don't say, well, there's an evil spirit and then there's a demon and they're separate or Satan's in charge of evil spirits, but he's not in charge of demons. I'm going to show you that they are one and the same and it's talking about the same thing. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. That word for devils right there is actually G1140 Daimonion, which we have already looked at multiple times. In other words, it is a demon. The demons are subject to us through thy name. And look at verse 18. And he, and that's talking about Jesus, and Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So the disciples have come back and said, Jesus, the demons are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus turned right around in connection to the demons being cast out. And Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. What does that mean? You may try to say, well, that was talking about something that happened at the beginning of the world when Lucifer fell. You might say it's talking about some kind of future prophecy, whatever you want to say. But Jesus used it right here in connection to the disciples going around and casting out demons. And when they came back with the report that they had been out there casting out demons in Jesus name, Jesus told them, hey, while all this was going on, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. In other words, Jesus was making a connection, regardless of whether you think it's a prophecy or whatever, that's fine. But Jesus made a direct connection to them casting out demons and Satan falling from his position of power and authority, dominion and might. In other words, his kingdom was starting to fall because they were casting out demons and destroying the kingdom of darkness, destroying spirits of infirmity, destroying evil and unclean wickedness, foul spirits, and delivering people and getting them set free. And they were literally tearing the kingdom of darkness completely apart. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And let's go on in verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Listen to verse 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The whole reason that I'm highlighting this is to show you in verse 17, the disciples said, the demons are subject unto us through thy name. Here, Jesus turns right around and says, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject unto you. And the disciples said it was demons. And Jesus reinforces right here that it is spirits. The Greek word, G4151, spirits. So Jesus is again showing us right here that demons are actually spirits and these evil spirits are actually demons. They are one and the same. Let's go to Luke chapter nine, verse one. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils. Again, that's the word for demon. He gave them power and authority over all demons. But now let's look at Mark chapter six, verse seven. And he called unto him the 12 and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because Mark 6 and 7 is the exact same story as Luke 9, 1. It is the exact same people, the exact same event, the exact same moment. Luke recorded that it was demons, and Mark recorded it as unclean spirits. Why? because unclean spirits are actually demons and demons are unclean spirits. There is no difference whatsoever. And I can prove it because when you go to Mark 6, 13, just a few verses later, 
It says, and they cast out many devils, and that is the Greek word for demons. So they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Why? And what's going on? Is because we saw in verse 7 that it was unclean spirits. But when you go to verse 13, it used the Greek word meaning a demon. So this passage again reinforces that unclean spirits are demons. And demons are actually unclean spirits, one and the same. There is no difference. An example that I can give you of this is looking at the life of Jesus. Jesus was his name, and yet he was also called Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Anointed One, Jesus the Son of Joseph, Jesus the Son of David, Jesus of Nazareth, and all of those are different descriptions and titles and ways to call him, yet it is the same individual. And so the Bible is letting us know, hey, if you're talking about an unclean spirit, an evil spirit, a foul spirit, a spirit of infirmity, it is actually a demon. If you're talking about a demon, you're actually talking about an evil spirit, a foul spirit that is under the control of Satan himself. They're all the same thing just using different terms to describe them or talk about them. Now, let me jump into a story of a deaf and dumb boy in Mark chapter 9, verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Notice that, a dumb spirit. And whithersoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnashes with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. So they all know and understand that this little boy has a dumb spirit, and the spirit needs to be cast out. Let's jump down to verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. So let's look at some things going on right here. Verse 17 called him a dumb spirit. Then in verse 25, it says that Jesus rebuked the foul spirit. And then when Jesus gave his address in talking to the demon spirit, he said, thou dumb and deaf spirit. Now those words for spirit there is G4151, meaning a spirit being. That word for foul is the Greek word G169, akathartos, which means unclean by legal or ceremonial standards, unclean in thought and life, impure, morally lewd. And something else I want you to notice again is that the root cause of the boy's problem is not a DNA malfunction. It is not a birth defect. The problem is that a demon spirit has locked up his vocal cords somehow because a spirit can make a manifestation happen to its host, and he has somehow locked up the boy's hearing to where he cannot talk, he cannot hear, and the demon spirit has been given an assignment from Satan himself to afflict this boy so that he can destroy the boy's quality of life and destroy his life and also cause torment to the family of the boy. Everybody's in torment. Everybody is suffering. And the Bible calls this spirit a foul spirit. Why? Because it is evil, impure, immoral, it's hateful, disgusting, destructive, and has no good intentions whatsoever. But now I want you to watch the sister passage in Matthew 17, verse 15. This is the exact same moment, the exact same event, and the exact same people. Verse 15 says, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falls into the fire, and oft into the water, verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the demon, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. 
So in Matthew chapter 17, verse 18, this spirit, this foul spirit, this deaf and dumb spirit is actually referred to as a demon spirit. Why? Because foul spirits, evil spirits, deaf and dumb spirits, spirits of infirmities are nothing other than demons themselves. And demons are actually evil spirits or spiritual beings under the control of Satan himself. Now let's go to Luke chapter 4 and start at verse 33. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. Now notice that right there because it puts it all right there together. There is a spirit, 4151, of an unclean demon. And this verse right here links them all together. There is a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And listen to verse 35. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in the midst, he came out and hurt him not. And something else I'll say right here is notice the manifestations that this demon spirit is causing. This evil and unclean spirit under the control of Satan. It says that this demon spirit cried out with a loud voice because part of a demonic manifestation is a very loud volume, a screaming out in terror and horror and not wanting to cooperate. Notice this. The demon spirit also spoke through the man and said, leave us alone. And notice also it says that he had thrown him in the midst. In other words, he threw him on the ground and may have just thrown him all over the place, making a huge scene in front of everybody that's gathered there and having a physical manifestation of this man writhing around and flopping all over the ground. But the point that I want to make here is that the Bible says that it was an unclean spirit. And in verse 35, it says specifically that Jesus rebuked the demon because demons are spirits and evil spirits are demons. Now let's go to Luke chapter 8, verse 2, in dealing with Mary Magdalene. It says, And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Now notice again the exact same context that we have been seeing over and over. It says evil spirits. Spirits is G4151 pneuma, meaning a spiritual being. That word for evil right there is G4190 Poneros, which means evil, wicked, malicious, mischievous. And then in regards to Mary Magdalene, it said out of her went seven demons. That word for devils right there is the Greek word G1140 Daimonion, which means a demon or an evil spirit. So this again reinforces that the evil spirits and the things causing these infirmities are actually nothing less than demons themselves. And something interesting to me is it also said that there was seven devils specifically in her. Not four or five, not nine or ten, but exactly seven. So somebody was counting and keeping track and it knew exactly how many because the Bible called out the exact specific number seven. And I think that's very interesting because Jesus references seven spirits more wicked than the original one in one of his passages. But let's now move on to Luke chapter 8, verse 26. And this is dealing with the story of the man called Legion. In verse 26, it says, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had demons, long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice, notice that again, a loud voice, not just talking, but a loud voice, said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, Most High, 
I beseech thee, torment me not. Verse 29, listen. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Now, several things that I want to point out to you. Verse 27 said that he had demons a long time, G1140. But verse 29 says that Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit. That is G169, Akathartos, which means that evil, immoral, unclean spirit. And verse 30 says that his name was Legion because he had many demons. I'm just showing you over and over that demons are unclean spirits. And evil and unclean spirits are actually demons. Now, I want to give you some examples of spirits in the Bible. And from the examples of the spirits, you will also be able to see some of their manifestations and how they affect people, whether physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, or whatever, because the spirit's name actually tells you what the spirit is doing. And I'm not trying to make an extensive list or an exclusive list, but just to give you an idea of some spirits that the Bible talks about. For example, the Bible talks about a spirit of infirmity, spirit of divination, spirit of bondage, spirit of fear, of antichrist, of error, unclean spirits, foul spirits, seducing spirits, devil doctrine spirits, blind spirits, dumb spirits, deaf spirits, familiar spirits, spirits of whoredoms, spirits of jealousy, haughtiness, spirits of pride, bitterness, downcast spirits, faint, deceitfulness, anguish, troubled, hardened spirits, and we could go on and on. I'm just trying to show you how the Bible talks about all of these different spirits, and they are evil and unclean spirits, and they are able to cause the manifestation that the word describing them tells you about. Now, something that I think is interesting is contrasting evil spirits with some of the spirits in reference to God. For example, godly spirits, and watch the reference and manifestation, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of holiness, in contrast to uncleanliness and impureness, for example, the spirit of life, in contrast to the spirit of death, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of meekness, the spirit of faith, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of promise, spirit of grace, spirit of glory, spirit of prophecy, spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And I can go on and on, but can you see how that the spirits of God are contrasted to and the opposite of the evil and unclean spirits and what they want to do? You can just look at the spirits of God and feel joy and peace in your heart because they want to do something good for you. And now let's go to the next session, which is where I want to tell you that Jesus and the apostles talked to demon spirits just like they were addressing a real life person. In Luke chapter 8, verse 30, And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion. And we see in this case, in this example, that Jesus may be looking at the man and talking to the man, but he is actually talking to and addressing the demon spirit. And I am not telling you in any wise or any way to start trying to have conversations and talk to demons or devils whatsoever. I am not telling you to talk to them because they're nothing but chronic liars, and they will tell you just enough truth to make you think that there is relevance in what they're saying. But they are liars and will lead you in a wrong path. Do not have conversations with demons. But Jesus wanted to know his name because he was fixing to address him and talk to him and expel him and cast him out. But the point I'm trying to make to you is that when they were addressing demon spirits, they realized that they were actually talking to a spirit. And so just like God is a spirit and you talk to him just like he's real and just like he's a person, or at least I hope you do, 
but they address demons just like they were talking to God as a spiritual being who is real and alive and address it as a person, like looking at them and addressing them and telling them what to do. Let's look at Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 16. And it came to pass as they went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by Sue's saying. This did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Now, the reason that I'm highlighting this is because I want you to understand that the girl was possessed or demonized by a spirit of divination. However, when the apostle Paul turned it says that he began to talk to the Spirit. And we know he's talking to the Spirit because he said, come out of her. If he was talking to the girl, he wouldn't said to come out of her. The point that I'm making is the Apostle Paul might have been looking at the girl, looking in her eyes, and it looks like he's addressing her, but he is not addressing the girl. He's talking to the demon spirit, the demon of divination. And he's talking to that spirit just like it's a person and just like he would tell a regular person what to do. He addresses the demon spirit and tells the demon spirit what to do and charges and commands him in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he expels, rebukes, and casts that demon spirit out of the girl. And now I want to jump over and cover that demon spirits actually operate in a hierarchy and have levels of organization, communication, and are literally like a kingdom and military. Going to Matthew chapter 12, starting at verse 43, it says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Verse 44 then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. So there's several things I want you to notice about demons. Just for information, this is not to scare you or create fear. Just to tell you the truth. It says that the demon spirit saith. So demons can talk and have communication. If they can talk, then they have a voice. They can form sentences and structure and context, which means that demons are mentally coherent and functional and have a reasoning process. He said, I will. So that means that he has a will, intent and purpose and desire and can even make decisions and has a range of choices on what he's going to do and not do. And he said he would return in other words, he knows where he came from and he knows how to get back, which means that he can track people, walk and follow and find them, and he has knowledge about who they were, where they're at, where they're at right now, and he knows how to get back. And then notice that this demon spirit said, into my house. So he considers the person that he left to be his dwelling place or place of residence and calls that person his house. In other words, he is staking claim to it and saying, it is my house. And then it says that he comes back and he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. So he can actually go in, look around, check it out, think, process, and reason. Which means to me that he can see a person's spiritual condition. He can see that the house has been put in order that things have been cleaned up and yet the house is empty, which means that demon spirits are actually looking at you spiritually. They see your spirit man. They know whether you are in good standing with God or not. They know whether you are filled with God or not. They can tell what's going on with you spiritually. Listen to verse 45. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Now notice that phrase, then goeth he. So he can travel, move about, come and go. And it says he taketh with himself 
seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So there is a hierarchy and organization of wickedness. They have structure. They are planning, strategizing, working out details on what they're going to do, who's going to do what, who's going to go with him, just like a military unit is trying to figure out what they're going to do to conquer a territory, a country, or a region. And it says that they enter and dwell there. So they go in and they take up residence and make themselves at home and set up a station or a battalion, hunker down, and the Bible says that the last state is worse than the first. In other words, the person is worse off now than when they first started. Now I want to move over and show you that demons are actually territorial and regional and operate in jurisdictions or provinces. In Mark chapter 5, verse 10, and this is talking about legion, it says, And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. That word for country right there is G5561, hora, which means country, land, region, or province. What am I saying and what am I showing you? I'm showing you that demon spirits operate in certain regions, countries, or provinces. And I believe that to be one reason they did not want to be sent out of the country is because it was their province or jurisdiction where they were ruling, controlling, and manipulating things. And the things that they had set up in society and culture was actually because of their influence and they did not want to lose where they were at. Now, the next thing I want to cover is to show you that demon spirits can actually possess animals as well as people. In Mark 5 and 12, it says, And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And so if you're wondering if demon spirits can go into animals, the answer is a resounding yes. It does not say that the demons went on them or around them or next to them. The Bible says that the unclean spirits entered into the swine and then they ran down into the water and drowned. Now I want to talk to you and explain to you that demons fear God and therefore fear the God that lives in you. James 2 and 19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the demons also believe and tremble. That word for tremble is G5425 friso, which means to bristle, to have one's hair stand on end, to shudder or quake in fear or aversion, to be horrified. In other words, demon spirits are shaking and quaking and are terrified and trying to avert or get away from God. And if God lives in you, then demon spirits are actually afraid of you. You are not supposed to be afraid of demons. They're supposed to be afraid of you. Amen, God bless you. Let me give you a summary and a takeaway. When it comes to devils in the King James Version Bible, it's actually talking about demons. We have seen over and over that demons are actually unclean spirits, evil spirits, foul spirits. And evil and wicked and foul spirits are nothing else but demons because demons are actually spiritual beings. We saw in the Old Testament that people were very familiar all the way back to the book of Job that people were familiar with spirits. That's why Jesus didn't have to teach or talk about it much because they grew up knowing and understanding that there were demon spirits. We saw in Old Testament passages that it talked about sires and shades, which were Old Testament references to demons and demons that were considered to be like hairy male goat demons. Whenever you see these references to male goat demons, they're actually tying into the Old Testament concept and understanding that Satan and Lucifer has demon spirits. In this video, I also showed you that Jesus Christ himself said that Satan was the one in charge of and commanding the evil, unclean spirits 
spirits of infirmities whatsoever to do whatever they were doing. And Jesus said if Satan cast out Satan, he would be destroying his own kingdom. Meaning that spirits of infirmity, evil, foul, unclean spirits, demons, doing whatever they are doing, are actually under the control of Satan himself, and he is their ruling, commanding officer. When it comes to manifestations of demon spirits, they are able to manifest and cause to happen the very thing that describes them, which is why they are described that way. If there is a deaf and dumb spirit, it's because that's the manifestation that he causes. We also saw that demon spirits have structure and hierarchy and organization, that they can think, reason, strategize, communicate, process, and see you spiritually and know whether you are empty or full, know whether you have cleaned up, straightened up, and organized, and got your house in order, but you are still empty, and can go back and take more spirits more wicked than themselves, and come back, and the end state is worse than the first. They can strategize, plan, think, reason, communicate, and do all of this stuff. However, you have been given power and authority over all demons, and you can tell them what to do. And you do not have to be a victim. You do not have to suffer. You can stand up in faith and authority and tell the demon spirits what to do and rebuke them. And just like Jesus and the Apostle Paul, we do not have to rebuke the person. We look at the demon spirit and talk to and address the spirit and tell the spirit what to do because ultimately the person is dealing with the spirit and therefore we address the spirit and tell the spirit what to do and to leave the person alone and get out of here and don't ever come back. Amen. God bless you. I've got to bring this to a close. I hope you enjoyed the video and that you learned something out of it. I want to say thank you to everyone for praying for me and my family. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you also. God bless you. I love you and appreciate you. You pray for me and I'll be praying for you. God bless you. I love you. And I can't wait to see you in the next one. I love you. Bye-bye.